Oh, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Welcome to Flashback February, and welcome to the county's west coast. You know, the main feature that dominates the west coast here of Prince Edward County is this, Weller's Bay. You know, and this area has really a very long and fascinating history. Let me just orient you a little bit better. You know, we're looking north here, a little more of a familiar view. We, can have, we have here the whole of Prince Edward County spread out before us, and up in the upper left-hand corner there, you can see Weller's Bay. Okay, I'm going to zoom in a bit, and we're going to look at this area for the next, uh, whatever, 45 minutes, and I'll talk about some of its varied history, including ships, storms, canals, lighthouses, and railways. But let me start first with a brief look at the region's natural history and its prehistory. Okay, I'm going to be zooming in and out a lot here, so I hope nobody gets too airsick. Um, we can see a bit of a larger area here. And you can see Weller's Bay. The most prominent feature of Weller's Bay is the strip of sand that separates the bay from Lake Ontario. Now, geographers refer to this sand spit as a barrier beach or a baymouth bar. Try to say that five times quickly after a bunch of bottles of beer. <laughs> well, technically, though, geographers classify Weller's Bay as a lagoon. Now, many millennia ago, glaciers covered all of this area. Eventually, the glaciers melted and they formed the Great Lakes. And in the process, large deposits of sand were left behind. Now in Lake Ontario, this sand was eventually carried along by currents until it hit pre-glacial limestone outcroppings. And these were remnants of ancient seabeds. Now wherever these limestone headlands would uh, appear, they would slow down the currents and then sand would settle around the rock, eventually forming these large barrier beaches. Um, over thousands of years, several of these barrier beaches were formed with lagoons behind them. And today we've named these lagoons East Lake, West Lake, Pikes Bay, Pleasant Bay, North Bay, and of course, Weller's Bay. Archaeological evidence indicates that there was human settlement at various places around Weller's Bay starting thousands of years ago. Some of these settlements were likely made by one or more paleo cultures. So those are the early societies that used only tools made from bone and wood and stone. For centuries, this area has been a hunting ground and it was used as a passageway by war parties of various indigenous tribes. We know that Etienne Brulé and his boss, Samuel de Champlain, came this way in 1615 with a Wendat and Algonquin war party. They were on their way to upstate New York to attack the heart of the Onondaga nation. Well, 25 years later, the five nations of the Haudenosaunee in return would have traveled the same route going the other direction to attack the Wendat missions at St. Marie on Georgian Bay. <coughs> well, eventually, this whole area of New France became a royal colony, and King Louis XIV sent the Carignan Salier Regiment to Canada in 1665 to put a stop to this fighting. The regiment built forts in the Richelieu Valley, and within three years, there was peace between the French and the Five Nations. So there was a temporary peace, and part of the peace terms allowed the French to send missionaries to some of the Five Nations villages. Starting in 1668, Sulpician priests were sent from Montreal to run a mission at the Cayuga village known as Kentio or Kente, 
This was the first limited settlement of Europeans in this area. But it only lasted a dozen years before the priests abandoned the mission. Some of these early explorers and missionaries kept journals and made rough sketches of their journeys. <coughs> they sent this information back to Europe, and there cartographers did their best to piece together maps of these new territories. Now this 17th century map shows Lake Ontario and the site of the Cayuga village. And archaeologists believe that this village, Kente, may have been somewhere along the shores of Weller's Bay, perhaps even here at Consecon. However, none of these 17th century maps or early 18th century maps really shows Weller's Bay. It was only with the influx of loyalists into Canada after the American Revolution that comprehensive land surveys were done and maps like this one, the Aerosmith map of 1796, finally show a somewhat accurate depiction of the bay. The earliest detailed map of Weller's Bay is from 1802. Now it's important to note that it wasn't yet called Weller's Bay back in 1802. This map shows it as Lake Edward. But let's take a look at some of the details here. So at the top here, we can see it says proposed canal. Now this is where the Murray Canal would be built, but that would be almost a century after this map was made. Down here a little bit further, it says portage. This was the portage between the Bay of Quinte and Weller's Bay. That's where the carrying place is now. And down here, it shows the outlet. It was just a little narrow stream that ran through the barrier beach connecting Weller's Bay with Lake Ontario. It wasn't until after the War of 1812 when the Royal Navy uh, surveyed much of the north shore of Lake Ontario uh, that this is one of the first times that the name Weller's Bay was shown on a map. This is a chart that was made in 1816 um, based on a survey done by Captain William Fitzwilliam Owen. Now it's called Weller's Bay, but you notice the surrounding waters are have different names. The Bay of Quinte is called Trent Bay, and Presque Isle Bay is called Newcastle Harbor. However, like the 1802 map, this one also shows a narrow outlet between the bay and the lake. So then, why is it called Weller's Bay? Asa Weller is said to be the first permanent resident of European descent to settle along the carrying place near the bay. The Wellers were originally Palatine Germans who had emigrated uh, in the early 18th century to the U.S., settled in Vermont, and around 1800, this late loyalist came to Canada, built a log cabin on the north side of the carrying place at its west end near the shores of the bay that eventually took his name. Within a few years, he had built a fine brick house. The house is still standing today at the corner of County Road 64, where the Portage Road and Gardenville Road meet. And that part of the bay that was closest to Asa Weller's property was for a long time informally known as Weller's Bay, while the portion of the bay closer to Consecon was often called Consecon Bay. And uh, quite a few years later, decades later in fact, the entire lagoon was officially named Weller's Bay. Now when Asa Weller settled here, the only efficient means of transportation from place to place was by water. Bateaux and schooners were the earliest vessels on Lake Ontario and the Bay of Quinte, and they were used quite extensively to transport both cargo and passengers. By the 1820s, larger sailing ships 
and steamboats are, were also becoming quite a common sight on the Great Lakes. When Asa Weller arrived on the shores of the Bay of Quinte, he saw the potential of the area as a major transportation hub. Let me just go back here for a second to the 1802 map. And the portage or carrying place you can see here had been used for centuries by the First Nations peoples. They portaged their canoes through the forest between the Bay of Quinte and Weller's Bay as they traveled along the north shore of Lake Ontario. Well, Asa Weller took this idea much further. He established a railroad across the carrying place. He used hardwood rails. He laid them from Weller's Bay to the Bay of Quinte, and he used a large ox cart on the rails to haul goods and people and lumber and even boats that were laden with cargo all across the portage. Now, of course, the locomotive that he used was a pair of oxen, and the rails were wood, they weren't iron, but this really was one of the first railways in North America. Well, by 1830, the transportation hub on Weller's Bay was a reality when Asa's cousin, William, who lived in Coburg, established a twice-weekly stagecoach service between York, which is now Toronto, and the carrying place. So while they waited for a steamboat that would take them down the Bay of Quinte to Kingston or Montreal, the passengers could stay at an inn that was built by Asa Weller. Now, the whole Weller family seemed to have transportation in their blood. But William's son, John Weller, later became the chief engineer on the Welland Canal. And his name lives on in the name of the Welland Canal's north entrance, which is Port Weller. Now here's a few images of the carrying place as it appeared in the 1830s. An engineer stationed in Canada with the British Army, Thomas Burroughs, painted these images and about a hundred more of these uh, showing the, everything between here and Ottawa up along the uh, Rideau Canal. Now, while the carrying place was developing into something of a transportation hub, even as late as 1850, the only vessels that could travel on Weller's Bay were canoes and rowboats and bateaux. They were flat-bottomed cargo boats. The outlet to Lake Ontario was just too narrow and too shallow to allow anything larger to gain access to the bay. But a series of winter storms in 1854, 55, and 56 changed all of that. In late winter and early spring, for three years in a row, huge chunks of ice broke up and were blown ashore to form what are often called ice shoves. Then violent storms from the west would pile up more and more ice on the Lake Ontario side of the barrier beach, and the wind and waves were so strong that the ice was literally shoved right through the beach. The piles, of, the piles of ice really acted like giant plows, and eventually they obliterated the northern stretch of dunes, and they transformed the tiny outlet into a narrow channel 150 feet wide and 14 feet deep. Now, this detailed chart was based on a hydrographic survey done almost 40 years later, and it shows the extent of the opening into Weller's Bay. Now, in this chart, it's a later chart. You can see over here, this is the deepest part of the channel. But at the time of the ice breaking through in 1856, 40 years earlier, the channel was a little bit further over here, closer to Bald Head. So just keep that in mind. This gives you an idea of how the, uh, the area changed over time. <coughs> 
Well, it was in June of 1856, the first ship in history entered Weller's Bay. This was the steamboat Chief Justice Robinson. And this was really the beginning of a new era for Weller's Bay as a safe harbor on Lake Ontario. The village of Consecon at the far end of Weller's Bay would really benefit the most from shipping that could now enter the bay. This is a plan of the village from 1853. Let me just orient it with north towards the top here. And already in the 1850s, Consecon was a thriving village. At the time, it was really only second to Picton in Prince Edward County. There were numerous shops, there were three churches, three mills, two hotels, and Consecon even had its own distillery. Now, while this is the earliest known plan of Consecon, here we have the earliest known drawing that depicts the village. This was drawn in August 1863. It was done by an officer in the Royal Artillery, a fellow named Lieutenant Henry Edward Baines. Lieutenant Baines had been sent to Canada a year earlier along with 12,000 other British troops. The possibility of war with the U.S. at the time was really quite, uh, quite real. However, at the time, President Lincoln decided not to take on Queen Victoria's army or navy. And instead, he had to concentrate a bit of his energy on fighting a civil war against the southern Confederate states. So, Henry Baines and many other soldiers were here in Canada. They needed ways to pass their time. Well, in addition to being a soldier, Henry was an artist. That summer of 1863, he was on leave from his duties in Toronto, and he was on a cruising vacation around Lake Ontario aboard the yacht Breeze. And you can see the Breeze here at anchor off of Consecon. Well, Henry kept a journal while he was on the cruise, and the journal included more than 30 pen and ink sketches and beautiful watercolor paintings. They showed places all around Lake Ontario, including Coburg, Presque Isle, Prince Edward County, Kingston, and several ports in New York State. Now, if any of you are intrigued to find out more about Henry Baines and his artwork, I've written a book about him, and it will be for sale here uh, after the talk today. Now, within months of the Chief Justice Robinson entering Weller's Bay, many ship owners, ship captains, and other private citizens were petitioning the Canadian legislature to make Weller's Bay a harbour of refuge. They wanted buoys and lighthouses set up to guide ships into the bay. Because the real issue here was that any ships sailing between Toronto and the Bay of Quincy or Kingston had to stay in the open lake and go around the dangerous Prince Edward Peninsula. Sailing from Presque Isle to Kingston alone could take anywhere from 8 to 24 hours, depending on the winds and the type of vessel you had. And during that time, if a storm came up, there was nowhere for a ship to, sh to take shelter. The waters of Lake Ontario off of Prince Edward County were so dangerous, and so many ships were sunk there, that this area became known as the Graveyard of Lake Ontario. By 1856, though, five substantial lighthouses had been constructed to guide ships along these hazardous shores. But there still was no safe harbour between Presque Isle Bay and South Bay at the other end of Prince Edward County. Now, Weller's Bay, though, would make an ideal harbour of refuge. But the question you might be asking is, well, why not just go through the Murray Canal, through the Bay of Quinty, much calmer, or even just use Presque Isle Bay as a harbour of refuge. Well, let me spend just a couple of minutes looking at these two questions. Let's start with the Murray Canal. Well, throughout most of the 19th century, ships had to sail around Prince Edward County because the Murray Canal did not exist. The canal wasn't officially opened until 1890. Back in 1796, Governor Simcoe had proposed a canal between 
Presque Isle Bay and the Bay of Quinte. We saw that on the 1802 map. And to facilitate that, he set aside a uh, strip of land, a canal reserve. It was about four kilometers long and 150 meters wide. It ran from Weese's Creek on, on Presque Isle Bay to about where Hutchinson Road is in Northumberland County. And uh, the rest of the route was really to just to follow the natural water course along Dead Creek and into the Bay of Quinte. By 1833, the first Welland Canal had been built and the Rideau Canal had been finished, so work was commenced on surveying the site of the Murray Canal in anticipation of getting it built to complement these other canals, which were all seen as vital to the prosperity of Canada. The province of Upper Canada hired the engineer Nicole Hugh Baird to determine the exact route of the new canal. Now Baird was a Scottish engineer. He had worked for several years on the Rideau Canal and he was one of the few professional engineers working in Canada at that time. He would later go on to design the Presque Isle Point Lighthouse as well as the first bridge across the Trent River at Trenton. But what does any of this have to do with Wellers Bay? Well, Baird was really to examine two canal routes from the Bay of Quinte, one leading into Presque Isle Bay, the other through Wellers Bay. Well, instead of surveying the canal reserve or even looking at the shortest route along the Portage Road, Baird focused his attention on the natural water courses between the Bay of Quinte and Lake Ontario. This was most, mostly a low marshy land. I've marked it in yellow on the map here. Now after surveying the two most promising routes, Baird recommended the shorter, less expensive route from the Bay of Quinte along Dead Creek and the natural streams and marshes in there all the way over to Wellers Bay at Stonebird Cove. This canal would include a single lock as well as a short outlet cut through the barrier beach to Lake Ontario. Well, unfortunately, the province of Upper Canada, always strapped for cash, deferred any decision on digging the canal. And despite receiving dozens and dozens of petitions from citizens, ship owners and ship captains, and despite spending thousands of dollars for more surveys <coughs> and more reports over many decades, subsequent governments of Upper Canada, the province of Canada, the Dominion of Canada, they all refused to commit funds for the construction of the Murray Canal. Well, decade after decade passed and no action was taken to provide a safer route for sailing ships um, or steamboats going between Toronto and Kingston. It has been estimated that at the very least, 17 ships and their cargoes and 55 lives were lost on Lake Ontario because the government refused to take action to dig the Murray Canal. Finally, in the run-up to the federal election of 1882, Sir John A. Macdonald came up with $700,000 from the Conservative government pork barrel to allocate toward building the Murray Canal. By then, there were three different routes that were being considered. One ran from the mouth of Dead Creek to Weese's Creek and into Presque Isle Bay. Another from 12 o'clock point to Stoneberg Cove on Wellers Bay. This is the one that Baird had recommended 50 years earlier. And then there was a third from the eastern end of the Portage Road to the creek that runs near Smokes Point and then into Wellers Bay. Well, this ended up being an election issue, a local election issue in 1882. Voters in Northumberland County wanted the canal to connect to Presque Isle Bay. Voters in Prince Edward County wanted the canal to connect to Wellers Bay. Now with two of the three proposed canal routes going through Wellers Bay, the Prince Edward voters were pretty optimistic that their member of parliament, James McQuaig, would have an easy time of getting the canal routed through Prince Edward County. However, the Northumberland MP was Joseph Keeler, an influential grain and lumber dealer who had the ear 
of the Prime Minister, Sir John A. Well, before Election Day, the Minister of Railways and Canals, Sir Charles Tupper, announced that the canal would run along the old canal reserve through Northumberland Co County, taking a whole new route altogether. Well, the timing of this announcement couldn't have been worse for McQuaig. He lost his seat in the House of Commons, and Wellers Bay lost out on being the terminus of the Murray Canal. But what about the idea of making Wellers Bay at least a harbour of refuge after a, a channel to Lake Ontario was carved out in uh, 1856? Well, some said that Presqu'ile Bay would be the perfect harbour of refuge. Just look at its size and how the peninsula there protects the harbour inside. The harbour entrance itself is half a mile wide it leads into a deep bay. There's more than 1,200 acres of sheltered waters. So surely, Presqu'ile Bay would be the ideal harbour of refuge and it could easily become a major shipping port. Well, the problem with Presqu'ile Bay is that it was very difficult to get into. There's a shoal that runs out from Presqu'ile Point two-thirds of the way across the harbour mouth. So ships sailing from Toronto or from Kingston would first have to sail toward the Presqu'ile Point Lighthouse, then they would have to alter their course, sail past the harbour entrance toward Barcoven. Now captains sail their ships, if they sailed their ships too far on that course, they would run aground. So they had to keep looking over their shoulder until they came in line with two smaller lighthouses on Presqu'ile Bay. These were the Presqu'ile Range Lights. Now then came the tricky part. They would have to quickly come about to sail on a line with the range lights and into the safety of the harbour. Now during a gale, this would be a very dangerous manoeuvre, so most ship captains, including those piloting steamboats, would not even try to enter Presqu'ile Bay during any sort of uh, uh, significant storm. So, Wellers Bay was really seen as a better harbour of refuge. The one catch here, though, was this rocky shoal. It seemed to obstruct the entrance to Wellers Bay. Well, for almost 20 years, engineers, surveyors, fishermen and ship captains argued whether or not that rocky shoal really existed. Finally, in 1875, when it was determined that the, the shoal truly did not exist, the government finally allocated $2,500 for a new lighthouse on Wellers Bay. One government report had called for piers to be constructed at the entrance to the bay, along with a lighthouse. But this plan was shot down, likely because the $2,500 budget would only cover a small portion of the costs of such a project. A cheaper alternative was to build a pair of range lights that ships could use to line up with the channel and enter the bay safely. Now range lights are a specialized type of lighthouses that are designed to work in tandem. The lighthouses are situated to line up precisely with the deepest part of the navigable channel. The rear light is always taller and a different color than the front light and ship captains know they are on the right course as soon as they see one light directly above the other. They can then sail into the harbour safely. The Wellers Bay range lights were constructed in 1876 at a cost of $1,444. Amazingly, more than $1,000 under budget. The two lighthouses were located at, at the end of the Portage Road on Bay Farm. This was owned by Reuben Young, who was a farmer, justice of the peace, and owner of the local tannery. It appears that in exchange for allowing the government to build the lighthouses on his land, Reuben Young was given the job of lightkeeper with a salary of $150 per year. This in spite of his advanced age. He was 71 at the time. Well, for the next 13 years, Reuben was the official lightkeeper of the Wellers Bay range lights, but he never did any of the work himself. 
Instead, he employed his head tanner, Edward Silverson, to light the lamps and maintain the lighthouses. A Reuben Young built a house for Silverson and presumably allowed him to live there rent-free in exchange for his light-keeping duties. The lighthouses on Weller's Bay were only two of more than 40 lighthouses in eastern Lake Ontario waters that helped guide ships to safe harbors through the graveyard of Lake Ontario. If you want to find out more about the Weller's Bay range lights and other lighthouses <laughs> that once dotted our shores and why this area was so dangerous, my book, For Want of a Lighthouse, will be for sale after the presentation. George is responsible for the sales. <laughs> so by 1876, right in this vicinity, there were six lighthouses. There were two in Weller's Bay. There were two in Preskill Bay, two more range lights. There was one large lighthouse on Preskill Point and another one on Scotch Bonnet Island. So with all of those lighthouses, all within 15 kilometers of one another, the west coast of Prince Edward County must have been very safe for any mariner sailing these waters. <coughs> well, even though these, light, these lighthouses were valuable aids to navigation, they were not able to prevent shipwrecks. The combination of wild weather and treacherous shoals all around the county, especially here on the county's west coast, led to many ship sinkings and loss of life. Mariners on the Great Lakes always feared the gales of November. But it was always those last few voyages of the shipping season that could mean the difference between making a profit and going bust. So captains kept sailing right through to the December freeze-up when ice in the ports would prevent them from going any further. The autumn of 1880 marked a particularly fierce and deadly storm season. In Toronto that November... Captain James McSherry had launched his newly rebuilt schooner, Bell Sheridan. McSherry's crew of six included four of his sons as deckhands. Johnny, Jimmy, and Tom were experienced sailors, and Eddie, the youngest, accompanied them as well. They loaded a cargo of wheat at Toronto, and headed off across the lake for Oswego. After they unloaded their wheat at Oswego, they sailed to Charlotte, which was the lake port for the city of Rochester. There they loaded 370 tons of coal for Toronto, then proceeded westward along the shore before making a course direct for home. That's when the storm hit. They reefed the sails, but by midnight, the main boom had snapped and the mainsail had been shredded by the gale force winds. They were blown 55 nautical miles across the lake. Their only hope was to get into Preskill Bay or Weller's Bay. They couldn't come about in time to make the difficult entrance into, Weller's, into Preskill Bay and they were probably too far north of the narrow entrance into Weller's Bay so in the pitch black of the early morning hours of November 6th, 1880, Captain McSherry dropped his anchors to ride out the storm between Preskill and Weller's Beach. But the winds were too strong. One anchor chain snapped and the other anchor dragged on the sandy lake bottom. A young Consecon farmer, Walter Losey, was an eyewitness. Guess we saw her spars weaving back and forth above the treetops from the farm as she dragged into the breakers. You see, she was more than an hour dragging across from Presqu'Ile, where she tried to get in and let go her anchors. She came over sideways, six miles. One anchor chain parted, the other holding across her bows, so she struck the beach broadside on. She was deep, drawing ten feet with her load of coal, and the shore was shoal. It was about noon when we got to the beach. 
It was lined with people, for they'd driven from Trenton and Carrying Place and all over. Never saw such a wind. The Bell Sheridan lay grinding on the sand with seas breaking on her as high as her mastheads. The crowd had helped Robert Rogers take the mast and sails out of his fish boat and dragged her up the beach to a place where there seemed some chance to get her out to the wreck. The Sheridan's cabin was gone and she was all underwater when the seas broke, but her bow was a little higher than the rest. And there we could see the crew huddled when the spray led us. I was only a farmer, 21, and young and strong from work on my father's farm. There were plenty of volunteers for the boat, but they took me, because I was husky, I suppose, and not too heavy, and could pull with the rest of them. There was William Andrew Young and Frank Bonter, Stephen Clark, the fisherman, and another Clark, a young feller from, from Consecon who taught school that year. Yes, and me. They pushed us out wading up to their necks in the water to give us a good start in the backwash. And then we shot from the shore like a bullet. Within 30 feet of the wreck, three seas, one after the other, rolled over the Sheridan and onto us. That stood the big fish boat right up on end and spilled us all out, with the boat falling over backwards over us, bottom side up. No, the water wasn't cold. At least it was warmer than the air. And we all clawed our way back up onto her bottom, digging our fingers into the edges of the lap straight planking. <coughs> then she rolled over, gunnels up, and we crawled into her again. But she was full of water, and the seas broke over as fast as we could bail. There was a strong current down the shore, and that set us away from the wreck. So we had to let the boat wash in on the shore and try again. The crowd waded out and dragged her up the beach further for another try. I've lost track of how many times the boat was pushed off and forced back. I would say at least six. As we pushed off for one more try, we saw a single figure, black against the western sky, work his way aft along the rail, pick up a broken plank almost as big as himself, and leap overboard as the next sea struck. We were too busy bailing and keeping her head to the sea for the next few minutes to see what became of him. But all at once, we saw a head in the water between arms stretched around a broken plank like a surfboard. We grabbed for him, and while we were getting him in, a sea burst and tossed us, boat and all, onto the beach. Men ran down neck deep and dragged us in. The young fellow was still hanging onto his plank. His arms were clamped on it as though frozen. They weren't, but the water that filled his hip boots was freezing to them in the cold wind. We stripped him in a fish shed and rubbed him to life, wrapped him in buffalo robes and hurried him to John Howes' farm kitchen. He was young Jimmy McSherry of Toronto, 19, I think he said. Little Eddie kept crying for Ma, and he died in my arms, and a sea washed him away. Dad died before that. Tom and Johnny were too numb to hold him up. He was talking of his father and brothers. Eddie was the youngest brother, only 13. He was washed up afterwards. The mainmast fell just after Jimmy jumped overboard. The foremast swayed for a while longer, then down it came, topmast and all, lying across the wreck for a while. The fish boat made some more tries before dark, but when the foremast fell and we could see nobody left, we gave up and lighted a bonfire on the beach. I went home. The bodies of Captain McSherry and two of his sons were never found. Jimmy McSherry stayed ashore for a year after that, but then he was back on the lakes again as a lake captain for many years. Remains of the Bell Sheridan can still be seen in Lake Ontario, just offshore toward the north end of the Barrier Beach. But that wasn't the last of the tragedies. Only 14 days later, another schooner suffered the same fate. The Garibaldi was ashore at Weller's Bay. The weather had turned much colder by then, and volunteers in a fishing boat from Brighton tried to rescue the crew from the ice-covered decks. Five crewmen and the cook, a woman, were rescued from the ship. One man, however, died. He was found frozen in a block of ice below decks. The following spring of 1881, 
the Canadian government held a formal ceremony right here in Consecon to recognize the bravery of the men who had risked their lives to save the crews of the Bell Sheridan and the Garibaldi. Special trains from Picton and Trenton brought folks from all around. The politicians, while they gave their speeches, and each of the rescuers was presented with a testimonial along with a check for $25. You can see Walter Losey's name there. We have a descendant of Walter Losey's here today. Tom, where are you? Put up your hand. Tom Livingston <coughs> lives right, uh, <coughs> right near where Walter Losey's farm was down on uh, Stinson Block Road. Now, for more than a decade after these tragedies, the Canadian government received petitions from mariners and other citizens to establish a life-saving station on Weller's Beach. The first life-saving station on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes had been established at Salmon Point in 1871. That station was later moved to Long Point, and then later still to Wellington Beach. Well, in 1898, the Dominion Fish Fisheries Department moved the station to Weller's Beach and provided $750 for a new Dobbins pattern self-writing, self-bailing lifeboat. Well, throughout the last half of the 19th century, Consecon had developed into a very busy town. It was growing as a shipping port for lumber, apples, grain, and fish, all being exported to the U.S. And the town eventually became a customs port, so U.S. registered ships could load and unload cargoes here. Here's a few photographs showing Consecon in the late 19th and early 20th century. Here we're looking down Main Street. You can see the three churches. This church, which is no longer there, the site of a garage now, that was the Presbyterian Church. Then over here was the uh, Church of England. Um, and then right here was the Methodist Church, which is today the, the United Church. The Church of England, the Anglican Church, is now the library. So standing at this spot, when the photographer turned right around, he would see this. This is where the Consecon water tower is now. This was the Consecon schoolhouse. The country kids didn't go to this schoolhouse. They had their own schoolhouse down Stinson Block Road. Now here you can see the, uh, the grist mill, and across the street from the grist mill is the Hayes Tavern. There's still a mill here, it's on the same site, but it didn't look like this um, at, um, until the 20th century. This is a 19th century view of the mill, it was a large stone mill right on Consecon Creek. And across the street from it was the Hayes ta Tavern, later called the Porter House Hotel. The right side of that, the five bays on the right side, were um, dismantled in the 1970s, moved out to Wapoose, and rebuilt. So that part of that building is still there in Wapoose. Here's a closer view of downtown Consecon. And here's a bit of a street level view. But Consecon was not the only port on Weller's Bay. There was a second port established here. It was at Pine Point near Gardenville. It was established in the 1880s. 
This port <coughs> is associated directly with the iron mines at Marmara and the other mines in northern Hastings County. The Central Ontario Railway shipped iron ore from Marmara and Coe Hill. The railway was originally formed as the Prince Edward County Railway in 1879, but the name was changed a couple of years later. <coughs> Eventually, track was laid from Picton to the northern portions of Hastings County. The original plan was to transport the iron ore by rail to Trenton, where it would be loaded aboard ships bound for smelters in the U.S. Now, the American mine owners had originally uh, thought that they would load ore ships on the Bay of Quinte and send them through the Murray Canal. But, as we heard earlier, construction on the Murray Canal didn't start until the 1880s and wasn't finished un until uh, a good eight years later. But, undeterred, the Americans financed the construction of two spur lines of the Central Ontario Railway. And they started near the Portage Road and they ran to Weller's Bay, where a massive wharf was built at Pine Point. The wharf would have looked something like this. And in 1884 alone, this pier handled 100,000 tons of ore. There was a rail yard with machine shops that were built and a roundhouse, all to support this, uh, this new venture and this new port. There's a few vestiges of this ambitious project still remain today. The main line is now part of the county's Millennium Trail. And the spur line running to Weller's Bay is still visible both from the air and on the ground. And this is what's left of the railway wharf. Eventually, iron ore shipments from Hastings County stopped, and general shipping into and out of Weller's Bay really dropped to a trickle after 1900. The railway pier was used as a coal dock for some years, but eventually that was also discontinued. <coughs> now, one of the ongoing problems with Weller's Bay as a harbor was the shifting sands of the barrier beach. And to remain effective as range lights, the lighthouses on Weller's Bay had to be relocated twice, once in 1889 and again in 1892. Finally, in 1909, the rear range light was discontinued. The next year, the front range light uh, was shut down and both lighthouses were demolished. During the 20th century, commercial activity in and around Weller's Bay severely declined. For a while, a busy cannery operated at Consecon, but that closed by the middle of the century. Commercial fishing in the bay continued throughout the 20th century, and even today, there's still a small commercial fishery in the bay. In 1938, the Royal Canadian Air Force built an aerodrome at Trenton. Here you can see some of the biplanes that uh, we had on, on the tarmac. And the barrier beach at Weller's Bay was used by these planes as a gunnery range and a bombing range. And there they dropped practice bombs. During World War II, the bombing range was used by the Commonwealth Air Training Plan and they used practice bombs as well as live high explosive bombs. The RCAF set up targets on the beach and built a number of observation towers around the bay. After the war, the beach was used as a rocket range for the Sabre jets stationed at the Trenton Air Force Base. Most of the control towers have now been demolished, but there are still thousands of shell casings from 303 and 50 caliber machine guns and 20 millimeter cannons, all littering the lake bottom and the beaches all around the bay. The range was closed in 1956, and it was declared a restricted national wildlife area in 1978. 
but the beach and the bay continue to be used for Army Reserve training and for search and rescue training. Now, the Department of National Defense still believes there are a number of unexploded bombs somewhere in the dunes, but they spent thousands and thousands of dollars looking for them with no success. Well, many people have asked me, well, what happened to the channel that had been cut through the barrier beach back in 1856? How or when did it get filled in? Well, we know that a combination of wind and wave and currents gradually shifted the channel over the decades. So it's possible that over many, many years, the channel just naturally filled in. <coughs> but it's also possible that a single catastrophic weather event could have contributed to the passage being blocked. Such an event occurred in 1954, almost 100 years after the channel had been <coughs> opened. That event was Hurricane Hazel. Now, Hazel hit the Carolina coast on October 15, 1854, as a massive Category 4 storm. But as she headed north overland toward the Great Lakes, she weakened considerably, as expected. But then she picked up speed and moisture when she hit a cold front over Pennsylvania and then turned directly toward Lake Ontario. The hardest hit was Toronto, where winds were recorded <coughs> in excess of 150 kilometers an hour, and the effects of flash flooding were devastating. Here in the county, 100 kilometer an hour winds damaged barns, blew roofs off of buildings, uprooted trues, trees, and brought down hundreds of miles of power lines. The grandstand at the Brighton Fairgrounds was utterly destroyed. Now, the stor storm surge, well, by shifting huge quantities of sand on the Lake Ontario side of the barrier beach, it's quite, pe uh, quite possible that the storm surge created by Hurricane Hazel could have contributed significantly to the blocking of the channel and cutting Weller's Bay off almost completely from the lake. Fortunately, though, through the efforts of the Friends of Weller's Bay, Dredging now occurs on a regular basis to keep a channel open between the Bay and Lake Ontario. Well, that's about all I have for you today. Come back in a year or two. I'll probably have some more fascinating snippets to share about the county's west coast.